So first I'd like to, to ask you um, reflections from you, Professor Bolton, after having listened to, so, so, to listen to, Captain, listen to Professor Bolton. Well, we were talking over lunch about how the problem with this discussion is that we will be in violent agreement. <laughs> um, so there won't be debate. So I am in violent agreement. I completely um, believe that we need much more commitment and alignment and sector by sector strategies. I was talking to a colleague here at the SSE earlier um, about the forestry industry and what it's going to take to get out of the pulp mindset, which means that they're going to have to close a lot of pulp plants, but that's expensive and how do you get the banks involved? And that's a sector strategy and I feel like that's what's, I, I, I completely agree. I resonated with, um, Sorry, I have like bifocals and they still don't help me. So um, <laughs> I, I, things that resonated with me, one, thinking about pricing risk differently than how we've priced it before. Uh, two, time frames have to be completely different from how people have thought about time frames. Changing the business model of the investment banks. And then you talked about not enough scale, and I think that's absolutely crucial that, there's, that we need to think about scale, and we need to think about what to scale and what to coordinate and what to leave to the, I don't want to quote George H.W. Bush, but like a thousand flowers blooming or whatever it is, because one thing that I hear, especially from small and medium-sized companies in Canada is, it's fine, all this stuff for the big organizations that have lots of resources to do all this reporting and this and that, but we need flexibility to be able to do it our way. And so the question is, where do we create the scale and the coordination and where do we create the ambition and aspiration and allow organizations to innovate in the way that they need? So those are just some thoughts from your very interesting talk, so thank you so much. Thank you. How about you, Professor Bolton? You initially remarked that you wouldn't be as positive and, and joyous as, as uh, Professor Kaplan, but more thoughts, please, about so, presentation. So, um, I, th I thought um, uh, Sarah's presentation and, and the book hits on uh, very important uh, observations. Um, the, the one that... Um, stuck in my mind is that uh, you can't just think of sustainability as the thing you do when your uh, day job is over. Uh, it, it, it has to be part of uh, how you do your job. Right. Uh, you know, minute by minute, uh, at every level of the organization. I think that's really key. Uh, I also liked um, the observation that you shouldn't think of the reporting as a cost. You talk to accountants, accounting professors, you must have colleagues at Toronto. They only, only talk about costs. They say, oh my God, uh, you have to do this reporting, it's costly, can small companies afford it? They never talk about it as an opportunity to discover something about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really a very important point. And indeed, uh, uh, companies, uh, often just, um, well, uh, tomorrow, uh, we'll think of it the same way as today. Um, we're, we like a quiet life. You know, why, you know, why change our habits? Right. And you need an external, you need an external push. Right. And I think uh, that's the positive side of uh, more disclosure requirements. So I thought those, these were two huge uh, takeaways. I also like the examples a lot. But, uh, I mean, for me, the, uh, the, it's still, you know, we need to do this at much gr a greater scale. We yes. need much more coordination across different companies. We can't think of sustainability just at the firm level. Mm -hmm. We have to think of the sustainability at, at the business community level, not at the firm level. Thank you. Let's, let's go back to the trade-offs. And you spoke of perspective and time. And do you have any examples from your research or, or other research where, where even trade-offs were not, you could really be s sort of solved even in the longer perspective, right. where it was really, really impossible? Well, I never like to say it's impossible. 
because I really do believe in human ingenuity. I do really believe that, I mean, think of all the things that have been invented in this world. Why can we not apply that human ingenuity? So, but you have to have the commitment over the long run. Mm -hmm. um, it does feel like I come from Canada. We have this big oil economy. And how are we going to transition from the big oil economy? It feels almost undoable because like the whole banking sector relies on it, the whole economy of many provinces. So it does feel hard, but I think that it's possible. And, you know, there's lots of examples, like one example, another example I have from Nike, you know, the Nike Air, the little bubble in the shoe. Well, that was originally filled with something called sulfur hexafluoride, which turns out to be a horrible greenhouse gas. And, but it was really stable and it stood up to people pounding on when they're running all the time and things like that. It took them 13 years to find a way to be able to have the bubble with a different gas. So they spent 13 years doing it. And I think, and there's lots of, you know, fiber optics, you know, not a sustainability example, but just the example of companies in investing over the long run. Um, you take a company like Corning that spent a decade and a half you, thinking about glass as a way to transmit, you know, telecommunications and other things. So we know that organizations can do it, but you need to create the right set of incentives and infrastructure and guidance and other the things that will allow and the this to scale and the, and the financial means to do it. So I'm, I can get depressed from time to time, but I just want to say humans are amazing in terms of what they can come up with. So I don't want to say that anything is not doable. I like that. <laughs> We talked at lunch about New York Climate Week. I just came back from, from New York this morning from, from moderating and, and broadcasting there. And uh, we talked about what I perceived as the impatience from companies there uh, pertaining to the, the policy makers not really be, being as, as, as strong as they, many of the business leaders uh, would wish for. And you, you talked a bit about this, Professor um, Bolton. So uh, in terms of... Um, of, of um, pushing uh, for, for more financial stability and solutions to, to be able to be in the longer, even the longer perspective to, to stay on course. Um, what, 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 what could we foresee and, and, and hope from the COP that's coming up now in Baku? Because it, it, it is dubbed the financial COP, and we do have the NDCs now. They were sort of ironed out during, during this week in New York. What, what can we hope for in terms of policies being implement it. Um, before I answer that, uh, on a more positive note, um, I wanted to say, uh, report a remark that uh, uh, President uh, Laurent Fabius made at a conference uh, recently, you know, in commemorating the 10 years after the Paris Agreement. And he said, pessimism is not an option. Right. Um, so that you know, that's a, that's another way of saying what, mm. uh, yeah. what you well, said. Well, it is an option, but we'll be uh, all underwater right. <laughs> or burning up. So <laughs> yeah. uh, either or. <laughs> right. But uh, but to come to the uh, Baku, um, the best you can hope for uh, Baku is th is that the, there will be pre preparatory work done that will be finalized in Belém. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's the best you can hope for. Um, but uh, don't expect anything major. It's, uh, uh, you know, uh, as I p pointed out, uh, in, in Dubai last year, 100,000 participants, mm -hmm. um, all the major business leaders in the world went mm -hmm. to Dubai and they had meetings around mm -hmm. COP. That's not going to happen in, in, in Baku. Mm, they're saving, their, they're saving themselves for, for Brazil next year. So there will be no Gvans, Gvans, it's difficult to say, the Glasgow uh, Accord um, in terms of finance happening in, in Baku. No. I, as, far as, I, as far as I can, you know, I'm not in the know. I don't know uh, all the initiatives uh, as an insider, but I, I would be surprised if anything major happened in Baku. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Bolton, uh, in terms of also... Um, making it possible to scale. How important are initiatives like the Non-Fossil Fuel Proliferation Treaty that's been discussed and also Ecocide that's now been um, proposed by three uh, Pacific Island nations to the Hague? 
uh, the ICC? Yeah, so the, 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 the idea is um, you want to, um, if, if you can get an agreement uh, uh, like that, is you want to give um, all the players certainty about where you're going, mm -hmm. at what pace. And I think this uh, also is relevant for what Sarah said earlier about smaller companies. They, they say, we want flexibility. We don't have the means of the larger companies. But it's not just flexibility they need. They need a clear view of where things are going. Because at some point, some of their activities will be banned. Mm -hmm. They need to know that. They need to know that sufficiently in advance so that they can start acting now. Absor you know, make, make, the, make the, the cost of transitioning away from their current activities uh, lower. Thank you. Would you like to add? You're good? I agree. Okay, good. <laughs> I violently agree. Violent, violent <laughs> agreement I mean, we over need, here. We need systems for changing the economics of, mm. of the decision making that organizations, because it just doesn't cost them enough to not move. Mm. And um, we need governments to worry less about the next election and worry more about the next flood that wipes out whole cities. Like in the US, you know, Asheville, North Carolina just almost doesn't exist right now, mm. you know. And of course, companies have a longer perspective than the four-year period that most politicians yeah. uh, are focusing on, right? Yeah. So, uh, Professor Kaplan, in your research, can you point out any sectors or industries that ha have that are more troubled about when it comes to integrating the sustainability aspects? I. I saw that as one of the preparation questions, and I'm like, I don't know if I have an answer for that, because every sector has some good players and some bad players. Mm -hmm. I think the sectors that are going to struggle the most, I mean, every sector has some heroes, and every sector has some villains. But of course, fossil fuels, I mean... That's, and, a, that's a given. You know, yes. it's sort of given, but then we don't think about the unintended consequences, for example, of all this reporting, like shell oil divests of the most polluting uh, refineries, and then it's been tracked that those refineries get bought up by these private equity organizations, and private equity, I wish we could, no offense to any private equity people in the room, but honestly. Um, <laughs> you then track the emissions of those polluting plants, and they're much worse after having been divested. Meanwhile, Shell Oil can do a better job on its reporting, mm -hmm. but the net effect for the planet is terrible. And so I think we also have to be careful about the unintended consequences, whether it's oil or forestry or whatever. And I, and I, so I feel like we're just getting the majors, we're just getting the most visible. One thing I know about regulations from my own work on, for example, diversity regulations, is that only the visible firms move. Only the ones that are heavily tracked by analysts, only the ones that are in the media all the time, they move. Nobody else moves. And so what about the, everybody else other than Shell and, you know, Walmart and, you know, the Royal Bank of Canada? So that's, that's, my, that's my concern. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you a non-prepared, well, you get plenty okay. of those non-prepared questions. Yeah. So, so if, you, if, you, if you just, the limelight is only on the big players, right. what is the role of activism in here to shine the light on, on the ones that are not so big right. so they don't fly under the radar? Or other organizations, right? Transparency International, etc. I mean, there are many organizations that really do well. But their a... strategy is to create pain for the biggest organizations, thinking that things will move. So that's who they create pain for. Mm -hmm. And it's also really hard to get data on these small. And mm -hmm. you know, the Toronto Stock Exchange in Canada, there's like 60 biggish firms, not even that big, but biggish. And then there's just like 800 tiny little firms that are publicly traded, but. No one knows how to get even information or track or it's not worth the time. For the NGOs are always like have no money. What money or what resources are they gonna use? It's much easier for them to attack Shell or Exxon. So I don't, I don't do you have a thought about that? <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, in your talks uh, CSRD. Yeah. I think that's the, re the way to go, mm -hmm. is uh, you want uh, disclosure regulations, mandated disclosure regulations. You start with the biggest firms, 
and then you go down the mm. size. You start with the listed companies, and then you go to towards the non-listed companies. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be it's going to have to be the model for mm -hmm. the whole world. I mean, the EU is taking a big step forward here, but I don't see this uh, being resolved uh, through activism because, as you pointed out, activism is effective if uh, if you concentrate your attention on the on the worst offenders, and the worst offenders are often the biggest companies, and so you know the activists get it right. But you know how how are you going to uh, mm. you know activists? There are only so many people. How are you going to spread them around to the 800 listed companies? Right, mm. so that's the problem. Personally, I'm, I'm 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 quite hopeful about the role of AI here because we have, and just here in Sweden, you 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 most of you might be Swedes here. You've probably heard of Klimat Kollen, was funded by Google, 14 million last year, and they're 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 using AI to to fish out uh, mm -hmm. sustainability data from from major companies and not just in Sweden. Right. And it's, it's, it's public yeah. if, uh, digits to, 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 uh, to dive into. And they're, they're also doing it uh, from, uh, from cities in Sweden, so you can go in and follow your own city. Are they, how are they doing on the Paris Agreement trajectory? And, so, and also we have, on the platform that I work for, we don't have time, we also have that type of information now coming in um, transparency and, and uh, accountability on the co uh, different companies. So, and, and AI, AI will be, I think, a uh, mm -hmm. huge player in this field to be able to get all that information out for very little money in, in very short time. Well, at least that's one good application of AI. So. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, Professor Kaplan, and, and the 360 approach, yeah. approach it's, it's fascinating. Uh, how would you say that, how is it differs how does it differ mostly from the regular csr approaches here and what are the sort of the the highlights of of this approach and as, as opposed to the regular csr um um, I'm happy to answer that, and I'm eager to, I think, I already saw there were like a million questions, so I'm also yeah. eager to hear from there is the people in the audience. We won't forget um, the mentee. So, the, I mean, I think the big point that I was trying to make with the 360 Corporation is that shared value and win-win is not enough. You have to do something much bolder, much more innovative, and that, that shared value, I mean, Mike Porter, you know, who created the field of strategy, and one of the core ideas in the field of strategy is that there are trade-offs. You can't be like a differentiator, for those of you business students, you can't be a differentiator and low cost. And then somehow he came up with shared value and pretended that suddenly trade-offs didn't exist. No offense to a, you know, a great hero of the field, but I, the trade-offs do exist, and so that means we have to do something different, and I think that's the conversation that I'm trying to change. Mm. And you also have a course, a class, mm. with the same name. Could you please share any of the most interesting discussions you've had with your students on this? Yeah, well, so... I love the conversations with the students because they're often not afraid to say things that other people will say. So I had one student who worked for a company, and we, we had a, because I really care about gender equality and I talk about it a lot, we had a session on gender equality issues, and he said, here's my problem. I'm a manager, I have a team of four people. I get rewarded on how well my team performs. Do I really wanna hire a woman who's about, who's you know 28 and may go on maternity leave? And he said the quiet part out loud, like no one says that. And in Canada, by the way, unlike in Sweden, we have use it or lose it parental leave for the second parent in Canada, but really almost no men take it. And women are shamed if they want to take less than, uh, less than, um, uh, l less than a full year. Oh dear. So he was basically saying, how do I, in my small little microcosm of my team, how do I break that trade off? And so it really, you know, I tried to give him an answer, which is long-term investment in the organization and in talent, and you should be asking your manager to fly air cover for you, and there's a lot of things you could say. But it did build in me deep sympathy, not for the CEOs. Honestly, the CEOs have a lot of resources and they should just be doing stuff. I have a friend who's a CEO in the room, now she's gonna give me crap later, but um, <laughs> um, but the, the line managers, the people who just manage small teams, those, those are the people I have deep sympathy for and who I was trying to talk to in my book and say, you can lead from any chair, you can be that innovator. So that's 
one inspiring thing that got me really thinking. Mm. Uh, we're going to take the mentee and, and just have one more question to both of you here. Um, Speaking of mentioning the CEO reporting to, I don't I pointed, know. I pointed vaguely, vaguely so that I, yes, not yes, calling vaguely. her out. Both of you probably <laughs> meet a lot of executives in your in your work um, to make then they need to make corporate decisions with trade-offs, of course, mm -hmm. all the time. Um, so, what, what, from your perspective, seems to be their biggest challenge um, tackling trade-offs when it comes to finance uh, uh, to sustainability, Professor Bolton? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, I don't speak to many CEOs, but uh, let me venture uh, a response. So first of all, I want to uh, very much uh, um, say that it's very important what Sarah said earlier about shared values, um, that uh, it's too easy uh, a way out, mm -hmm. and you have to be very careful when you hear this kind of wording and uh, this kind of framing, um, there are trade-offs, there are trade-offs. And, uh, and then, so coming back to another po uh, important uh, point that Sarah made during her talk, where do you start? When well, you start by becoming aware of the trade-offs you're facing, and I think that's where CEOs come in. They're, 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 we, we, we've been indoctrinated by Friedman. We've been indoctrinated mm. by shareholder value maximization. It's always about, well, how do we increase the bottom line? And then only later we start thinking about other issues. And I think that mindset has to change. That mindset has to change. The CEOs have to start from the beginning about uh, uh, framing the question in terms of what are the trade-offs? Have they actually identified all the trade-offs? Where does it make sense to give up a little bit of profitability to do the right thing? I think that's where, how, I, how, I, how I would put it. Would you go as far as to say, since we are really facing a lot of, well, transgressions of planetary borders and Mm. The tipping points of the climate aspect. Would you say uh, uh, that this is a moral obligation for leaders, business leaders, as a leading question? But it is absolutely a moral obligation. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, let's face it. You know, we 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 did not come to we did, we weren't born to try and grab as many resources on Earth. I mean, this was a gift to humanity, and uh, you know, we, we just cha have to change our mindset. Mm. Thank you. Like what he that. said. What he said. Yeah. Wonderful. More time, more time for the Menti questions. So Emma, first of you, you have a microphone on and you I have do. a computer full of questions. I have. And we have seven minutes. Quite many questions. Um, yes. So we'll start with one for Patrick Bolton. What are the potential drawbacks of climate finance? Could reliance on it lead to dependency, misallocation of resources, or create inequalities, especially in developing countries? Ah, mm -hmm. good one. Thank you, that's a great question. So um, the evidence is that, well, at least the, the evidence I've come across, when you look at uh, a green bond issuance, um, there's much more green bond issuance in advanced countries than in emerging market countries. And uh, indeed, uh, imposing environmental standards on some investments has had the consequence of um, reducing investment flows to emerging markets. However, what's also true, and that's just based on some research I've done, is that uh, when, you, when you look at a, a, a large asset manager like BlackRock, we were mentioning earlier, when you look at the, their, their entire portfolio, their asset holdings, they are applying, BlackRock is applying a carbon filter. It's uh, in aggregate, investing more in companies with lower emissions. If you disaggregate, you find that BlackRock divests mostly from carbon emitting firms in abroad, in foreign countries, and in particular in emerging markets. Mm. So it's a mixed picture. Mm. It's a mixed picture. Mm. Thank you. Would you like to add? No, no good question. Yeah. Yes, please. A question for um, Sarah Kaplan. 
What do you think about companies that are doing the opposite of Nike and Walmart and being extremely successful like Shine? Oh, oh yeah, Shine. Mm. I'm not of the right generation to even really know that much about Shine, but... <laughs> um, oh, you would be surprised. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um... I mean, there's a backlash against, I mean, they have been successful and there's also a backlash against, a, you know, from a lot of young people who are in the slow fashion movement. I got to walk around Stockholm the other day with my friend Andy, who's here, and we got to see some slow fashion, recycled clothing stores and things like that. I, I think that, that that's not a, Shine strategy is not a long-term strategy. That's a short-term strategy, and... Going back to my first question. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think the long... People aren't going to put up with it, so... I mean, but then there's Exxon. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. There are companies that are doing very well by not doing good. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but I, I think, in the end, the tide is turning against them. And there are going to be more... Um, there, as there is more transparency, real transparency, there will be more pressure. So I'm, the, everything I see about Shine is negative. So that's the, their long-term brand. I mean, if you care about brand value, it's not, it's not good for them. And now we're starting to name the hurricanes Hurricane Exxon instead of Hurricane Helen. Yeah, and maybe you should exactly. say the flood Shine because I mean it's all contributing yeah. to the. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I just want to add uh, something yeah, here. Of good. course, we talked about Shine, but. Um, Let's talk about um, um, General Motors and Ford, mm -hmm. okay? Um, they're now facing um, real competition from Chinese EV manufacturers, okay? And they're basically lobbying to kill the competition through tariffs. Um, I think this is just not acceptable. I think this should not be allowed. I think China is working for the good of the world in developing its EV industry. We should embrace it and we should move along with it, but we shouldn't try and kill it just to preserve the inefficient business model of, uh, of, of brown uh, 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 automobile companies. Yep. Thank you for that input. Uh, you talked about... Um AI, and there's a question for the both of you. How should companies tackle AI since it is a huge emitter of carbon emissions? Mm. Uh, okay, so I, 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 uh, I've looked into this a little bit. Um, the, 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 the electricity capacity of the US is now already not able to deal with the demand for electricity from AI. Um, the, there's a, a major Midwestern grid that runs through Ohio. It's going to be at full capacity in, in three years' time. Um, all the major AI companies are scrambling to try and get their hands on electricity production, which creates problems for others. Mm. And uh, when it comes to the expansion of, uh, of uh, more energy product, uh, electricity production, how do you do that in the short run? Gas fire power plants, coal fire power plants. That's terrible, absolutely terrible. Uh, now, Microsoft did, made a deal, which I, I think is a re interesting um, because it wasn't commented on much. Microsoft has now uh, done a deal to restart the, the Three Mile Island nuclear plant. Nobody raised any objections, which I thought was interesting. They are. Uh, miss that. Uh, oh dear, even, yeah. you know, even that is going to take some time just to uh, get started, uh, mm. let alone all the security issues right. around nuclear. For the younger population, you might not know, but there was a nuclear incident at Three Mile Island yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, I, the other thing I would say is, and this is really where government comes in, the big barrier in the United States is not even creating renewable energy, it's creating the grid. It's building the transmission lines, and that, that takes a long time and is expensive. And if someone wanted to innovate some way of making that, I mean, that would be a massive change. So, yeah, AI, I don't use it that much because you have a word in Sweden for flight shame, I think. I don't remember what it is. Yeah. My Swedish is so awful, I just know it when I hear it. I have, I have AI shame. 
<laughs> like I try not to use it because every time I do, I'm like, oh, but think about how much of the grid is being used. So I, <laughs> I have, I'm just guilty all the time, that's basically. Um, but so I do think that this is really important, but it, I think it points to this we've got to solve these bigger, what the government can do and governments can do is solve these bigger things like how do you get grid built? Do we have time for at least one more? We I think, do. I think we have one more. We do. Um, to Sarah, why even celebrate the sustainability of unnecessary products like Air Jordan sneakers? Uh -huh. Ah. <laughs> Any on a sharp note here? It's, it's a very good question. Um, I think it also relates to my point about human ingenuity. Mm. We're humans. We get motivated by, you know, whatever, my shoes, my shirt. Like, you know, it's hard to say we're going to take the joy out of everything <laughs> and knit our own boots or whatever we might do. So, but I think it's a big point. And, and, and I do think we should all consume less and pick the one Air Jordan and not have a closet full of Air Jordans. And I think we can all be thoughtful, still have joy, but be thought, have it be more thoughtful joy. But yes, I think it's hard. I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily want to wear the Air Hobbit myself. But I kind of liked <laughs> it. Do want to add anything? <laughs> we'll end on, I wouldn't wear an Air Hobbit. Is that how we're ending today? Okay. <laughs> well... We need coffee, and all of you uh, need to talk to, about, talk to each other about what you just listened to, this fabulous fireside ch chat. Thank you very much, Professor Kaplan and Professor Thank Bolton. Thank you. And we will be back here at 4 o'clock. There's coffee outside. Please be back in time for, for, for us to start at 4. Thank you, and an applause.